Well, welcome back. Now, more than a thousand children were referred for puberty blockers by the Gender Identity Development Service, or GIDS, run by the Tavistock and Portman NHS Trust until it was recommended for closure following a succession of devastating reports. The woman behind these exposés is Newsnight journalist Hannah Barnes, whose book Time to Think lays bare the inside story of the collapse of the Tavistock's gender service for children. Now, Hannah joins me now. What a piece of journalistic work this is, Hannah. My Thank goodness you. me. Um, what you're saying in this book, basically, regardless of where you are on trans or the legitimacy of the service itself or indeed the children going there, you're basically likening what happened at the Tavistock to a medical scandal on a par with, say, mid-staffs or even one member of staff comparing it to the 1980s East Germany athletes doping scandal. That's the scale of this. Well... Both those comparisons are made by staff who actually work there themselves. That's not, that's not my judgment. Um, this is the reflections of clinicians who have worked with hundreds of distressed young people throughout their time at JIDS. So those are their reflections. And I think, you know, those headlines have been across the, the newspapers this yeah. week. But actually what those clinicians are saying is, uh, and what the book says is, we, we don't know yet. What, what we do know is that some people have been helped by the clinic and, and their stories are in the book and it it has done and is still doing good work but we also know that some young people have been harmed and I've spoken to some of those as yes. well so as to the scale each way we, we don't yet know because there aren't the data there and JIDs haven't followed up their patients. But according to the book and you've done extensive research and you've spoken, spoken to countless people involved in this the data was really never there the data wasn't there to say that these puberty blockers, which were meant to give kids time to think, were actually going to help them with the problems that they were suffering with gender dysmorphia or indeed mental health problems or anything. As you say, in some cases, they were referred for these puberty blockers after one appointment. Very rarely, I've got to say this, very, very, very rarely. Um, and sometimes t two appointments and, and the CQC, the, the healthcare regulator, when they inspected it, found, found evidence of, of two session assessments. Um, I think, like you say, with, with the data, the, the underlying evidence base, according to national health bodies that have undertaken systematic reviews, is, is very low for, yes. for, for puberty blockers in the treatment of um, gender-related distress. Um, and, and what JIDS did rightfully was... There was evidence from a team in the Netherlands for use of pu puberty blockers in a very select group of young people. And JIDS rightly in 2011 said it's not strong enough, so we need to do our own research. But then before they had the data from that study, they rolled out the early blocking of puberty anyway, because um, prior to that, you had, puberty blockers were available in, yes. in, in England at, at the age of 16. Um, but they, they were predominantly didn't... used for kids who perhaps were having early puberty just to stay. Oh yes, off. no, they were licensed for precocious puberty. Yes. But but even for for, for for the treatment of gender related distress, they were yeah. they were used. But they rolled it out, and then what so many clinicians have told me is that they rolled out an intervention which had a limited evidence base anyway to a group for which it was really never designed for, to yes. whom that that evidence base didn't apply. So. Whereas it was designed for young people with lifelong, you know, from childhood gender incongruence or, or distress, yeah. who were psychologically stable in supportive living environments, it was rolled out by JIDS, and their leaders have said this on the record to Parliament, to a completely new cohort of people who hadn't had gender dysphoria since childhood. It had often come on with the onset of puberty and adolescence, who often had multiple other difficulties they were contending with, with mm. their mental health, and who sometimes were living in rather chaotic living arrangements. Can you talk about the link as well with children with autism? Because they're overrepresented in some of the patients that JID saw. I don't know what more I can say, apart from, yes, they do seem to be highly <laughs> overrepresented. So from JID's, the papers that they've published, they estimate that around 35% of the young people they were seeing displayed moderate to severe autistic traits. Yes. And that would compare to around 2% in the population. Now, they would say that not all those people have an autism diagnosis, but that's what they were seeing. And I think this is, again, why clinicians who have worked with young people in a variety of settings were saying, should we be asking questions here? Because 
that number is really, really yes. high. And it wasn't, I want to stress, it, it wasn't that they were saying that no one who is autistic could be trans as well. It was just the numbers involved should have caused pause for thought, really. How much of a role do you think has ideology had to play? I say because that rise in referrals up 2,700% since JIDS opened in 1989 obviously has coincided with um, a campaign on transgenderism which kind of fits into the public mood and therefore you think, well, that clearly is reflected on the number of children you're saying who are identifying as a different gender in adolescence. It must be part of a trend. But I think what intrigues people is how much do you think ideology had to play in the sense of referring for puberty blockers because they wanted to ensure that people who said they were trans could be trans, even perhaps without giving thought to those who in later life might live to regret it? So I think ideology played a part, but for me it's not the overarching reason why this happened. And I would make the point that, you know, this coverage of the book this morning in The Observer, and I'm here talking to you, it's not... For me, it's not an ideological story, it's a healthcare story. Yeah. Um, and the book is very much written in an evidence-based way. It's calm, it's, it's not, oh, it's not about so. ideology. Um, ideology did play a role. Um, you know, pretty much every clinician I spoke to, and I spoke to dozens, very strongly felt the influence of um, trans-supportive or trans-led groups on well, their work at JIDS. Because mermaids and... Um, gendered gen intelligence. Gendered intelligence started influencing which clinicians sought saw certain children because they didn't feel that they were encouraging the children to go on the puberty brothels. Well, yeah, I mean, I have clinicians who have gone on the record to say that letters were received from the head of mermaids that would ask for a young person's clinicians to be swapped. And they say that that was, you know, that was carried through. Um, JIDs themselves say that, that mermaids never influenced uh, clinical practice. And I think I think they, they did influence it, but I think it'd be wrong to say that they got everything they asked for. You know, for, for years, mermaids asked for the age at which young people could be referred for cross-sex hormones or gender-affirming hormones to be given, and that never happened. Mm. I think it's actually a bit more subtle. I think they had some influence, and particularly with, with the clinicians thing, but I think perhaps they stopped, they prevented JIDs from changing direction when they could have, because yes. there was this fear of them. So I think it was a bit more... There was a bit more being in the background. Yeah. Let's come full circle. We talked about this being a medical scandal. We now that, know that a number of people are suing the Tavistock Trust. Do you have any update on that? Do you know how many num people have joined this action or where the status of that legal... I don't. Is? I mean, I spoke to the lawyer some time ago who was behind it, but I have no idea on the numbers, I'm afraid. I mean, some of the stories, I mean, you talk about um, Ollie Stroke Harriet, you know, regretting mm. having had gone on to have surgery. I mean, I presume when you wrote this book, some of those cases must have really struck something in your heart, you know, children making life-changing decisions at such a long age, young age. Yeah, and I, I spoke to Harriet very recently and she's doing really well, so that's good. That, that's good. Um, yeah, it was very, it's very upsetting and some of the stories in the book are really distressing and anyone who's written a book knows it's a very lonely experience. Um, but, you know, I think Harriet's story actually speaks really to the whole issue and that you know for her there was an element of social influence there was you know she was a heavy social media user yes. she was you know she didn't want to be a lesbian she had mental health difficulties and all this cocktail of things came together and she was really happy for a while as as a trans man and it it, it didn't last and and what she was saying is that these issues were really quite obvious and they, they weren't explored. Yeah. And that's all these clinicians are saying. For some, it will be right. But, but for others, they it, needed it, more explanation. Yeah. Well, Hannah, um, it's a fascinating book, Time to Think. Um, Hannah's a Newsnight journalist and she's written this astonishing book. So if you want to find out more about these issues, then do please read it.